Good day, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our Infor OBE Virtual Global Summit. I'm here to introduce one of our prestigious speakers, and uh, let me do this very quickly so that we can listen to her talk. So Dr. Carpenter is the founding dean and professor of engineering at Campbell University. She's an expert on issues impacting the success of women in STEM and innovative STEM curricula. She received the 2022 Bernard M. Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education from the National Academy of Engineering. She earned both her MS and PhD in mathematics from LSU, where she held a prestigious LSU Alumni Federation Fellowship. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, Let's welcome Dr. Jenna Carpenter. Thank you welcome very much. Back. Good morning. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about engineering, engineering education for the future. Uh, I'm going to look at some global uh, issues, things that are going to impact uh, engineering education, employment, living conditions, and then look at how that's going to impact future educational needs of, of STEM professionals and for engineers. And then I'm going to talk, since I am president this year of the American Society for Engineering Education, a little bit about what ASWE is doing about that. So the uh, World Economic Forum uh, 2022 in Davos uh, identified five key takeaways on global employment uh, needs and trends. One is the need for investment in education, healthcare, childcare, and elder care. Uh, the second is the need to get more women in the workforce worldwide. Uh, certainly the digital skills gap, which is growing, has got to be addressed. Um, the future of work, uh, the fact that that's going to be rooted in energy transition, and the need for a paradigm shift in the way organizations operate. And I'll point out that many of these things have really been exacerbated by the global pandemic. So um, first of all, why education, uh, health care, child care, elder care? Why are those so important? Uh, despite uh, the move during the pandemic to more work from home or work anywhere, uh, long term, many jobs can't be performed solely remotely or in the metaverse. It's just not going to be possible. That means we've got to value what what has been called essential work. And I will point out that uh, essential work, uh, particularly pre pandemic, is not something that societies have valued a lot. A lot of what we consider essential work is it paid terribly well. Uh, maybe it's not considered terribly prestigious, but we all quickly learned uh, what happens when essential workers are not there. Uh, everything grinds to a halt. So we do need to value that better, uh, pay that better, and then invest in support structures that facilitate in-person work. And you're going to see that a common theme uh, as I talk about these global issues here. And so invest in investments in these three foundational social institutions, healthcare, uh, child care, ed elder care, and education. Those are the types of investments, the type of support structures that will help us restart the engine of social mobility post-pandemic across uh, economies. Uh, and that ties very much to the second point, which is women in the workforce. So uh, it's not a mystery. Uh, women were more likely to be impacted by the pandemic than men, primarily because worldwide, they still tend to do more of the caregiving than men do. And because women worldwide are employed in some of those sectors, those essential work sectors, that have been impacted the greatest by the pandemic. In fact, Deloitte's Women at Work Report 2022 found that uh, burnout and uh, lack of flexibility uh, have been spurring women to look uh, for jobs uh, more than they did last year. So in the U.S., we've had what we've called the great resignation. We've had tons of people quitting their jobs, going to new jobs. And so what we found is that even though that was pretty big last year, uh, this year, even more women are looking for work. And it's primarily because of burnout and lack of flexibility. So the pandemic exacerbated conditions that were already there. It wasn't that women weren't burned out uh, or, or needed more flexibility pre-pandemic, but the additional stress put by the pandemic has just sort of been the tipping point. 
Of course, women uh, worldwide tend to be more highly skilled and more educated than men, and yet they're underrepresented in the workforce by about 20%. Now, we know what some of those reasons are. Worldwide, uh, there's still a lot of stereotypes and biases against women working, and those stereotypes and biases, that implicit bias, does real damage. So that's certainly part of why women remain underrepresented and underemployed. But of course, things like child care, elder care, that's part of that caregiving we were talking about, providing that uh, worldwide would help close the employment gender gap. And certainly, um, we've seen uh, technology revolutions in how work gets done. I know uh, in the US, uh, in universities, within a few hours or a few days, we totally switched to a total online way of doing our business, even though we'd never done that before. So new social contracts, new way of getting work done, new social contracts that, again, that support people that have some flexibility, uh, that try to uh, oppose burnout and do things to help people keep from getting burned out. Those are really going to be core to growth. So companies that go back and, and say, you know, we're going to go back to everything exactly like it was in 2019, as though the last two or three years haven't happened. Those are going to uh, struggle, but companies that say, you know, we've learned a lot uh, in the last few years, we're going to do things differently. I call that making lemons from lemonade. And so that's true for uh, universities as well. We need to figure out new social contracts uh, for the way work gets done. Uh, the third thing that the um, World Economic Forum pointed out was an issue is the digital skills gap. So uh, it's not a mystery that uh, more and more jobs may need more and more tech or digital skills. Even jobs that maybe traditionally we wouldn't have thought of as being tech heavy, like say a truck driver. Uh, because of uh, monitoring and sensors and GPS and a and hundred other sorts of things, uh, even jobs that haven't had a heavy tech focus in the past do now. That means that there's a massive reskilling of the workforce that is needed for the digital economy, which we're already living in. Uh, and certainly in the tech world and engineering, uh, things are changing quickly. So there's also a huge need there, one that uh, higher ed is not doing a very good job of meeting. Uh, and in fact, uh, this skills gap uh, is really slowing the green transition, which we really need to combat climate change. Certainly this summer worldwide, we have seen impact of climate change, wildfires, searing heat, floods, uh, and this is not going to go away if we don't do something about it. Uh, and so this green transition, transition to a digital economy is really being slowed. And so that has economic impact worldwide. Uh, more and more jobs are being created by small entrepreneurs because they're using IT systems uh, in ways that would not have allowed them to do work before. In fact, 9 million new jobs were created this way between 2020 and 2021 alone. And again, those sorts of jobs, things being done remotely, things being done in the metaverse, all require a whole new sil a set of digital skills. Again, in higher education, uh, transitioning to online meant all of us had to develop new digital skills in a very short time that we had never used before. Uh, and so, as I said, you know, universities are not doing a great job of this. Universities largely tend to be focused on the same type of students they've always served, you know, kids coming out of high school to get a four-year degree, a master's degree, a PhD. But this reskilling doesn't call for that. These are going to be short-term uh, training uh, there's been a huge eruption of industries offering uh, online learning platforms, certificates, things to upskill their workers. Universities really need to get on board. Most developed countries in the world have a declining birth rate. That means you have more people leaving the workforce, retiring than you have coming in. And so if we're going to be producing the type of engineering talent that the world needs, we've got to figure out ways to serve alums, employees in the region, uh, companies in the region, uh, by something uh, like certificate programs or upskilling programs uh, that may be in person, may be remote, uh, but that don't require a full degree. I talked a little bit about the energy transition. Um, certainly, that's going to be a huge part of uh, the economy moving forward. We're all seeing, uh, you know, a move to, for example, electric cars, electric vehicles, and the need for uh, better technology to address a lot of the challenges and issues there. And so, um, one key takeaway: again, we've talked about the fact that many developed countries have a declining birth rate, uh, and I know in the U.S. in particular, uh, not only is there fewer students. 
but they tend to be uh, women and underrepresented minorities. So those portions of the population tend to be growing, at least in the college uh, going category. And so uh, if you want to attract young people today to come into engineering, the green industrial transformation is gonna be your ticket. That's the most attractive thing. They care about it much more than say people my age might. Uh, partially because it's going to impact their lives for, for much longer. Uh, and so if you really want to attract them, that's going to be key. Paradigm shift for organizations. As I've said, you know, we've all done a lot of paradigm shifts uh, in the last few years because we had no other choice. Uh, but the, the message is that these changes are not going to go away. The workforce is going to be more fluid. It's going to stay that way. Again, that great resignation, so many people changing jobs uh, in the last few years is not likely to stop. Uh, attrition rates are likely to stay high for a couple of reasons. Uh, today, students are not going to work for the same company for 20 or 30 or 40 years like maybe their parents or grandparents did. They're going to change jobs a lot more often just because everything is changing. Uh, companies may come and go, technologies and skill sets change and evolve. And also one of the things we've seen during the pandemic, people switch jobs because that's the best way to get a pay raise. So uh, experts say, you know, that's here to stay. Uh, so that means that companies need to really change how they're thinking about talent. We've talked about the fact that many, many countries have a declining birth rate. So you've got this gap in the number of people that are, are available uh, to train and the number of jobs that we have to do. So instead of thinking of employees, companies need to think about talent. And that means leadership needs to think about how companies operate, how work gets done differently. Uh, so the focus has got to be how do we find talent to get the work done, not how do we hire people to get the work done, which is a very, very different uh, uh, experience. Certainly, we've seen some of that with the rise of the gig economy in the U.S., I think of things like Uber, uh, you know, so have kind of replaced taxis in many places. So that's going to spread to other sectors. So the talent ecosystem for a company is going to include permanent workers. You'll need some of those. But contract workers, retirees and students, remember that skills gap, the, the lack of people. Uh, so retirees and students are going to be one way to try to fill in uh, some of those positions uh, that arise because we simply don't have as many people uh, as we have jobs. And so for all of this to work, when you've got people that are not permanent employees, you've got to have a much more flexible hybrid environment. And again, we've talked about the fact that um, uh, burnout is a serious issue, caregiving, elder care, all those things are coming into play. That means uh, that companies are going to have need to have a much stronger focus on empathy and caring for people. If you want to avoid attrition, uh, then you're going to have to pay attention to your people, provide the flexibility, the type of environment so they can uh, live their life, get their responsibilities done. Now, I've got a couple of slides here, about three, on global living conditions, and these are global risks. There's a ton of details here. What I really want you to focus on are the colors. Notice the green or environmental risks. The red are societal risks, purple are technological, and the uh, blue are economic. So if you look at zero to two years, that's his first slide. The top issues, the top global risks, uh, again, this is World Economic Forum, are uh, environmental and societal. Probably not a mystery uh, given the pandemic, a lot of the upheaval worldwide uh, that we currently are experiencing. So primarily environmental and societal. If you look two to five years out, environmental, societal are the top four. Uh, we have one economic debt crisis coming in there, another environmental, human environmental damage. A couple down from that, cybersecurity failure. That's the first one that's technological. Certainly something we're already experiencing. If you look five to 10 years out, wow, it is dominated. The first five are environmental, the next two are societal. Again, one adverse, ta adverse tech advances is down there toward the bottom. So the message is that environmental and societal risks are what we are going to be dealing with for the next decade. And of course, all of these environmental risks, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, all these things, they're not going to go away in 10 years. There's not some magic switch that we can flip. They're going to continue to be the things uh, that are our global risk, which means that in engineering and the tech world, these are things we've got to focus on. And that's not at all what we currently focus on. So 
Uh, what are future educational needs? If these are the challenges we're going to be dealing with, we've talked about reskilling. Uh, estimates are that by 2025, half of all employees are going to have to be reskilled. Somebody's got to step up and do that. If universities don't, industry will, uh, because we are moving to the digital economy. We increasingly use technology in more and more ways all the time. Much of that fueled by the pandemic or sped up. Um, there's really key uh, skills in four areas that employees are going to need. Problem solving. We do a good job of that in engineering. Self management. We really don't talk about that. Working with people. Most engineering programs don't do a, a good enough job there. Technology use and development. We kind of have that one. So half of these things, though, we don't really do in engineering. Uh, and these rapid changes in technology, all of this hybrid remote work, which authorities think are here to stay, means that self-management skills are more important because we're not going to be in an office supervised by somebody else 24-7. So things like active learning, learning how to learn, learning what I need to do with all the changes. I've got to reskill all the time. Resilience, uh, certainly at my university, Campbell University, resilience is something that we teach. Stress tolerance uh, and flexibility. Um, so top 10 skills. Uh, uh, sorry, I am, uh, you have one minute to finish this talk. Okay. Please. All right. So uh, these top 10 skills, many of the same things. Again, problem solving, resilience, those sorts of things are, are also key. Uh, so ASWE is doing some things. We're doing faculty training. Uh, we are uh, working to get uh, U.S. engineering uh, uh, community to admit a much broader spectrum of student so that we can uh, meet those workforce needs, not only focusing on students that come well prepared, uh, looking at the engineering curriculum, not a mystery. We need to change some of those sorts of things. And then trying to help universities get those industry 4.0 skills uh, in the curriculum. So lots and lots that engineering needs to do to bring all these skills that we currently don't teach uh, into the curriculum. So happy to chat about that. If you want to email me, be more than glad to do that. So thanks so much, Amy. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Carpenter, for a very highly informative presentation. I wish you all the best. Thank you thanks. so much.